Welcome to the definitive guide to how Facebook ads actually work. How does an ad actually work? What is a Facebook ad? We're going to dissect this down to how post IDs function, how Facebook actually measures everything that happens within that post ID and the web page you're actually promoting and not the one on your site. Plus how that actually turns into targeting so that you never need to worry about bidding models or audiences ever again. And ultimately how dynamic ads function so that you can understand why if you're not currently using dynamic ads, you are 100% not setting yourself up for success. So we're gonna dive into all of that right here, right now. Definitive guide to how Facebook ads actually work. Let's go. But first, I just wanna say this, thank you very much. I know you could be anywhere on the internet right now, and I'm going to make sure the next half hour is 100% worth your time. If you need more help, go to links.facebookdisruptor.com, sign up for everything, and don't forget to subscribe, ring that bell. Let's go. So, first thing, post IDs. So every time you make an ad, Facebook assigns that ad a post ID. Now, really what this is, that is Facebook's way of designating the file. Where is it? on Facebook's website because your post ID is actually a web page. If you ever notice the post ID of your ad, it is facebook.com backslash a bunch of numbers. That's your page ID. And then it'll say posts or videos or something else. And then another backslash and another long string of numbers. That is the post ID. Every ad you make is actually a web page. Now, what Facebook is doing when they make this web page is they are measuring the click through rate, the bounce rate, the stickiness, the engagement rate, how likely people are to positively experience with that. And ultimately, every downstream metric that you might use on CRO for your own web paging customer journey, Facebook is doing that for every single post for every single ad that ever gets made, whether it's an organic post or not. And you have to remember, the Facebook news feed is really just a collection of these posts. The Facebook news feed is just a media-rich version of the Google search. So it is just a bunch of web pages that you can scroll through. Anytime you make any post on Instagram or Facebook, that's how it works. And the news feed is just this collation of all of these web pages. So when Facebook is looking at what happens, do people respond positively, right? Do they scroll through a carousel? Do they watch a video? Do they read an image? Do they hit like? Do they share? Do they comment? Do they read the comments section? What are people doing when you show them this web page? How likely are they to see that web page and then leave Facebook right away? How likely are they to, when they see that web page, engage in some way and then come back to Facebook potentially if they leave or stick around on Facebook for much longer because they were shown that content? What is the correlation to a positive user experience, which is ultimately Facebook's business model and the content that we are making, the post IDs that we are putting out there? Now, Facebook is ultimately also seeing how people behave and then using that information to choose who else to show your content to. Because remember, even if it's not an ad, if it's just an organic post or maybe a Instagram reel or a TikTok or YouTube short or Pinterest idea pin. Ultimately, these optimized CPM environments are saying, who likes this? Who else is eligible to see it? And what happens if we show it to them? And then using that information of how everybody has responded, for instance, how you have responded to content over the last 10, 15 years that you've been on Facebook, what images, what videos, what words make you respond positively or negatively? What types of content, what topics of conversation do you engage with in a way that is desirable for their business model and not a liability to their business model? And based on that, they're gonna show you more content that is like that in which you are going to have a positive user experience. That's why even if two people had the exact same user experience on Facebook, followed the exact same pages. Once they start to behave a little bit differently 
even if it's not on Facebook, because Facebook is also seeing all of your credit card activity, all the pages that you're on outside of Facebook, all of the content, all of the things that you're doing on your phone. Because remember, you probably don't log out of the Facebook app if you have it on your phone. You're probably not logging out of the Instagram app when it's on your phone. So it's tracking everything that you're doing, all the places that you've been, and collating all of that information in the algorithm to figure out what you want to see. If those two people had everything the exact same, except they didn't live the exact same life, and maybe one person went to one building and somebody went to another website, and they traveled in different directions, they're going to see a different user experience. Even more than that, when it's showing, when we bring ads into the environment, once you start to stop and look at ads, click on ads, or ignore them, that environment, that user experience, that Facebook newsfeed is going to continue to evolve rapidly every time you swipe up to see a refresh on that feed. It is ultimately creating a new user experience. Now, why this is really, really important is because it ultimately breaks down into some fundamentals that we need to understand as marketing advertisers. The first of those being, if we are a liability to somebody's bottom line, in this case, Facebook's bottom line as a business owner, then we have to understand that that's not going to help us reach good people. So if your ad is very buy now, or if your ad is maybe immature, or if your ad is in some way either lacking in data or ultimately not presenting a user experience that Facebook can easily present to somebody else to give them a positive interaction and ultimately meet Facebook's business goals, then your ad is a liability to their business model and they will charge you a higher CPM. I've been seeing a lot of conversation lately around CPMs of $50, $100. And understand that this is a direct ramification of content being made that is not something that people are responding positively to. Moreover, if you are asking Facebook to deliver you business results that it does not have the data to give you, if you're not out of the learning phase, if you're running a conversion campaign on 50 bucks a day to sell something that's $100 and you're seeing wicked high CPMs, maybe it's because there's nobody for Facebook to know with high confidence is going to see your content positively. And as a result, the other people where Facebook does have more data, where content may have been designed to improve the estimated tax rate, they're going to get higher quality impressions. So when that user is swiping, what are they going to see? And these higher quality impressions tend to come when somebody's on the edge of making a purchase, picks up their device. What is that first impression that they're seeing? How likely, like if your ad gets shown only when somebody's 30 minutes into their Instagram news feed, only when somebody's 15, 20 minutes into their reels, only when somebody's been on Facebook for the eighth time today, you're getting lower quality inventory because your web page that you've made on Facebook, remember, when you're making a Facebook post, you're just basically coding a web page. That experience is less desirable for people. Now, if you've been reading the tea leaves here, you're also noticing that this gets down to another fundamental truth and that Facebook ads do the targeting. There is no benefit to using Facebook ads to uh, audiences to improve your AOV. There's no correlation. There's no correlation between LTV and a custom audience or an interest group or some detailed targeting. As a matter of fact, you are more likely to see less stable, less desirable, lower incremental lift when you are using detailed targeting instead of letting that ad go out unabated and be shown to all of the people that that ad should be shown to. Because remember, Facebook has looked at the click-through rate, the bounce rate, the stickiness, the engagement rate. 
how well people respond to that content versus some other option. And because of that, Facebook is choosing who else to show it to. Now, organically, this is the people that are following you or the people that have liked your page or the people that are in your group. What are they seeing? We also see very aggressively and something that TikTok moved forward more aggressively than anyone taking what YouTube was doing beforehand and pushed the needle to the 10,000th degree. And Facebook is getting a lot better at it. We're seeing reels from accounts that you've never seen before. But because of all of the other content you've engaged with, Facebook thinks you might like to see this. And that's why you could have 100 followers and get a reel, get a million views. It's not that your 100 followers watched them, you know, all that many times. It's that you were shown to way more people. In the same way that that reach, that view count, that engagement is a meritocracy on the content. The CPMs that you pay with your ads are the exact same type of conversation. If you make content and make ads and produce post IDs that people want to see in their newsfeed, that they engage positively with, that ultimately meets Facebook's business objectives, you are going to see lower and lower CPMs because the CPM is ultimately a tax on your business relationship with Facebook. And what this really means is every time you pay extra for detailed targeting, because remember, all detailed targeting costs extra. When you pay extra money to restrict and prevent those ads from being shown to everybody that wants to see it, what you're ultimately doing is forcing those ads to be shown to a larger number of people that don't necessarily want to respond positively to it because you said out of this, 50,000 person or 5 million person audience, I want to make sure that you're showing it with this dollar amount. Now, ultimately, that ad at broad is going to run unrestricted. Every impression that is good for that ad will be delivered. And you are going to win auctions that are far more desirable for your ad account, for your business. Ultimately, for the bottom line of whatever company that you're running ads for or yourself, and because you're not forcing bad impressions on people, you are allowing Facebook to create better user experiences. So you are, one, being more aligned with Facebook so that you don't have to worry about necessarily getting CPMs that are over $40, $50, 100 dollars that's not going to happen when you use something like this. Also, you're providing greater incremental lift to the rest of your business. Because instead of just focusing on this small group of people and paying way more to reach them, you can reach this much bigger group of people for a lot cheaper. And ultimately, that's going to help with your search volume. That's going to help with your email volume. That's going to help with the reach that your TikTok videos get. That's going to help with your email open rate because you're reaching a higher quality of people at a higher volume for a lower cost. Now, these are simple, basic business economics. These aren't arguable points. Some folks say, well, broad doesn't work for me. My reaction to that is you haven't tested ads that work at broad. You've only been able to make things work in a small little silo. And ultimately, if your business only works when you can't grow it, how good is your situation to begin with? If you have to rely on lookalike audiences and interest groups that pretty heavily overlap with the data set that you already have, and you're not growing the size of the pie by reaching a whole bunch of new people, then at some point, Aren't you just basically working really hard to prevent the growth that you're looking for? And this is one reason why we don't use targeting audiences. Because also, and there's way more videos you can dive into on my channel about this stuff, way more podcasts, way more content, but audiences don't work like you think they do. 
Remember, an interest group is full of just as many people that feel negatively about that topic as those that feel positively. And one third of that audience is actually there by mistake because the interest group technology is a decade old. It was invented by Facebook to bring Google advertisers onto the platform 10 years ago. It was introduced in 2012. How good do you think 10 year old technology is in a rapidly changing digital marketplace especially when half of those people are in that interest group because they don't like something and if one third of the people even before you start shouldn't even be there that means two thirds of every dollar that you could potentially spend two thirds of that entire group is actually bad for you so if that audience is say three million people there's maybe one million people that your ad should even be shown to and now hopefully your post id the overlap of the people that that post id where facebook wants to show it to because remember facebook is, is deciding who wants to see this and who doesn't basically every ad makes its own lookalike audience again that is an analogy and a hard fact not arguable Anybody that disagrees with it, fine, you're wrong, but you can have that opinion. That's fine. Um, I've worked with the engineering department. This is literally how the product was designed. And Facebook has been telling us this for a decade. And everybody ripping off Facebook literally uses the exact same model to grow. TikTok is literally that exact same thing built to grow on that exact same principle. Create content get data on who likes it, show it to more people who are likely to like it. Show it to more people that look like those that responded positively. Every ad is making its own look alike audience. We literally just established that in an inarguable, hard data, objective fact function. So we can move on from that conversation. My point here is, if that available audience that you are using if the overlap, if the Venn diagram of the ads lookalike audience doesn't have a lot of overlap with that other 1 million people, you are spending a lot of time and effort and investing a lot of impressions to tell Facebook that you don't give a damn about their business model. And your CPMs are going to go up. Now, you're going to get some wins. And look where... There is an overlap is great. And maybe you get really solid performance right away. But is it scalable? Is that somebody that is incremental to your business? Knowing that broad or lookalikes or interest groups, literally every single impression available on Facebook is ultimately still a retargeting impression because Facebook has determined that you want to see this content because of other behavior that you've taken. Other websites you've been to, other words that you've used, other content that you've engaged with. Even if it is impression number one for your business, that impression is a retargeting ad to somebody else's journey. So with all of that being said, if you are dramatically reducing the scope of who you're allowing that ad to see by eliminating the large majority of the people that are in that ad's own lookalike audience by restricting it down to just the people in this in the lookalike audience that you've defined or in the interest group that you've defined or the retargeting audience that you've defined when you've paid extra to make it way more difficult for that ad to reach good impressions and ultimately deliver Facebook's business model, which puts you in a good relationship that sets you up for long-term success. When you have paid extra to do worse quality work and you win by getting sales, my argument is this. One, is that sustainable and scalable? The answer is always no. Number two, would that person have bought it anyway? Is it incremental? Are you using branded search? and bottom of the funnel retargeting and email and influencer and working on organic do you need to do all of that stuff or more importantly 
instead of introducing a thousand new people or 10,000 new people to the business, was it really a good investment to make sure that one person that was going to buy tomorrow still buys tomorrow? What is the opportunity cost of making your Facebook ad look good because you don't understand how the post ID makes an audience and ultimately and when you pay extra to make success more difficult, does that grow your business? Now, objectively speaking, the answer to that is no. So we can extrapolate from that very simple conversation that using targeting audiences, bad idea. Hold stop. There's no use for them. You can get good results today. You can make Facebook look good, but ultimately the business will suffer because you're chasing vanity instead of performance. And if you're not building for the environment that curates good performance, ultimately you're going to struggle because you don't understand how Facebook works. Now, the last thing that I wanted to cover here, because I think it's incredibly important, is dynamic ads. Every single ad account should be built on the back of dynamic ads. Again, sort of an opinion, but we're gonna back that up with objective facts, and I'm gonna struggle to find a way to prove that that's not what you should be doing. It's been years, hundreds of millions of dollars, hundreds of ad accounts, dozens of examples, people from, you know, dozens of countries and six different continents, folks that I've had conversations with and people that I've trained, students and clients of mine. This is a hard fact for every single one of them. Dynamic ads are something you should be using. And instead of trying to undermine, well, like I don't use dynamic ads for my creative testing and I'm gonna go build post IDs and well, I already have look, I already have all this stuff. Let's throw all of the bad advice that worked in 2017 before the Power Five was introduced. Let's throw all of the guru agency, like I'm searching for vanity metrics to prove my value instead of actually growing your business because I run an ad agency and I don't give a damn about your bottom line. Let's throw all of that out the window. And let's just start real data. Let's have a real conversation about data. Let's start that. When you make a dynamic ad using dynamic creative, remember how a post ID collates all the information? In a dynamic creative, that dynamic creative ad is the post ID. And now every element of that web page is dynamically responding to that impression, which means that one post ID is actually collecting information from every permutation of ad that is built within that dynamic ad. So to put this a different way, you could build 20 individual ads to try out to see what happens with five different images and four different headlines with your one primary text. Okay, that's 20 different ads. Now you can try that to run the scientific method across all of it. And maybe you're even doing something like running ABO to make sure every ad gets the exact same spend, whatever, to try to control for this scientific process. Well, let's really dive into what you're doing. You are making 20 different web pages that don't talk to each other, that are competing against each other in every auction. Odds are the vast majority of them are not good. Maybe there's two or three of them that are desirable. But because you're trying to get a scientific read on all of the data, forgetting the fact that spend is a meritocracy because Facebook is built on the back of understanding customer journey, so we don't need to do that type of testing. That's not how it works. Then you are investing more heavily in losses than in wins. You're also investing a lot of impression share. The, the majority of the money that you spent is into an asset that you're not going to use again. So you are investing heavily in disposable assets of no value on the hope 
that the assets that do work, one, that you're able to identify them, two, that you're able to replicate their success, and three, that you're able to pay off for all of the losses just to break even. Now, when you think about it in that way, that's a pretty terrible way of running a business. In fact, no real business runs like that at scale. That's just playing the lottery bad for business. Now, moving forward, let's dive into one or two other things about dynamic ads. Instead of competing with each other at every level, now, if we were to instead put all of those elements into one dynamic creative, now that one single post ID, that one web page that has dynamic elements within it, is curating all of the data from everyone to create the best user experience. And then we can extract the post IDs from that by basically seeing an itemized list of permutation by estimated action rate by hitting the Facebook post with comments preview and seeing what out of all of these actually meets Facebook's business objectives. Then we can index that against where did the spend go? What performance do we like? Is this test even good? And we can develop high confidence assets built on the back of every bit of investment. So instead of setting 90 cents of every dollar on fire and then hoping that that one 10 cent investment where we got lucky pays for everything else, we can say that every penny informed the data set of the actual post ID that we're running with. And now on day one, it's launching on the back of all of the work that we've done instead of in spite of all of the work that we've done. Trying to put this in one other way, let me be more obtuse with this and give a real world example. When you make 20 different ads, think about it like this. You're hiring 20 different salespeople that never talk to each other that are going after the exact same set of leads, often retargeting those leads with each other. So you unleash all of these people to knock on doors in a neighborhood. You're going to have one house be knocked on by four or five, 10 of those salespeople. When one of those salespeople gets the sale, is it because they're the best one or because they were the 10th time somebody answered the door? How pissed off am I going to be at your business because every single day I'm getting hit on my door by two or three of your salespeople and I don't want to buy. The vast majority of people are getting really pissed off at you. But to be fair, that's sort of the industry standard way of running ads, which is horrible. It makes no sense. When you actually break it down, it's what you're doing. There's no defense to that logic. It doesn't work. Instead, dynamic ads would say, you're going to have one salesperson that knocks on every door that knows about how that person wants to be communicated to and instead curates their sales pitch to meet that person's needs, to give them the best chance of positively embracing seeing that salesperson. Now, yes, that one salesperson is going to be smarter. And yes, that one salesperson might hit on a few things early that work and try to replicate that. And yes, that one salesperson isn't necessarily going to tell you this is the best exact permutation of everything. Because they don't know. But we can look and see. Well, when we showed them this picture, this video, they responded better. When we use this opening line, our headline, they responded better. Now, maybe it's not the best image and the best headline. That's okay. Because ultimately what we're worried about isn't the best single element across each one. It, what is the collective learning of the entire in investment that we've made? And then ultimately, how do we use that to make sure that every penny we spend produces the best post IDs that are already completely aware of how users want to be engaged with 
and that ad because we ultimately go to market with the best post id it's collating all of the targeting data it's collating all of the user information and it's going to go out there and have the best chance for success on day one because it's not actually day one it's sitting on the top of every single door that you've knocked on from every single and permutation of every single sales pitch that you've done so it's not one salesperson that was lucky enough to get a few people to say yes after a week of just abusing an entire neighborhood it's the one salesperson that took the time and effort to give a damn about the people before they knocked on the door that is now really, really good at their job and you're letting them do the one or two things they do the absolute best and you're taking the rest of that to market. Now, one of these ideas makes complete sense and actually has a hit rate of about 80, 90% of producing really high confidence, really stable assets that you can invest really heavily in. The other one, is building individual ads, worrying about audiences, using ABO or manual bidding, and basically running Facebook like it was Google 10 years ago. Which one of those things do you think is ultimately easier, more scalable, more stable, creates a higher bit of incremental lift, and at the end of the day, gets you the lowest CPMs on your account, sometimes less than $10, on you know domestic US conversion objective campaigns. And then which one of those do you think is really commonly used by the same people that whine about $50 CPMs that are still trying to tell you what type of ad works really well today, what audience is working really well today? And I'll leave it at that. I'm gonna not throw in too many pejoratives because I'm trying to be a nicer guy. Anyway, that's something for you to think about. This is how Facebook ads actually work. Again, from the engineering team and the product team, because I was there when we built it over the last 10 years, giving feedback on hundreds of millions of dollars of spend. That's the insight I'm trying to give you today. Once again, thank you if you made it this far. Please hit like, please subscribe, please comment. Just go ahead and like the video if you made it this far. It means everything to YouTube's algorithm to tell them that you responded positively to this so they're going to show it to more people. And if you like this too, subscribe if you're listening to it on podcast, share it with your friends, comment with any questions you have, and thank you so, so much. And until next time, I'll see you on the internet. I think YouTube thinks you should like some of this stuff. Go ahead and subscribe there. Links at facebookdisruptor.com. Go there to find a million more resources. I'll see you later. Bye.